Harry and Meghan, they kind of are largely untouched from negativity from your pen in this. So, you know, a lot of the speculation is that you are a mouthpiece for Harry and yeah. Meghan. So what is your relationship with Harry and Meghan at the moment? I'm not their friend. I've never sat down with Meghan privately for interviews. I've never uh, exchanged information with Meghan. I'm not in their private world in any way whatsoever. Are you fighting their corner? No. It feels like I have you're... been, during Meghan's time as a working member of the royal family, I was extremely sympathetic for the mm. position she was in. I was one of a number of journalists that are part of that small pack that covered the story for, as a full-time job. For me, there were things that I saw being written about in the press, thick comments that were being made about her, unfair treatment when it came to how she was being written about compared to say how we've written about others in the past. And so I called it out. You know, I work in the American press. I'm not restricted by some of the limitations of being a member of the British press and that relationship with the royal family. So I did go on television and talk about the racism that she faced. And rather than anyone wanting to talk about it or listen about it, I was called her fan, mouthpiece, cheerleader, etc. So I can't run away from that narrative. It's stuck. You know as well as I do that tabloid nicknames stick forever. But Harry and well, Meghan... See, this is where I have a bit of a... And I don't mean to cut across Yeah, here. go for it. I find a lot of this content quite tabloidy too. Yeah. So, you know, you, you, you got to bear it, the brunt it, of that as it well. It delves as into... As part of the American press crew, you don't have a, a role within the, the reporting pack over here with the royal family. We know Meghan was in touch with the first book and, and, and sent some advice your Well, way. she wasn't in touch with the first book. Via an aide. She spoke to her communications officer and I discovered that okay. at the same time as the rest of the world So it did. happened. But... Um, so it happened. It's so, the job of a communications officer at the palace to deal with the press. All right, Greg, what do you got? So let me first start off by saying Mark and I have been discussing something for weeks, weeks in front of you right here. Where we're trying to come up with a name for this glass painting. We had different names. And I call Mark and I think we have a good one. I, I was sitting doing something else and thought of fourth walling. Fourth walling in theater is where you don't break that plane. You assume nobody's there. What we see in a lot of these guys when they come in doing what I'd call glass planing before is they come in with a story they're going to tell you. They're going to respond to the questions they've prepared to respond to and not to others. And that's fourth walling. They're not interacting. They're not improving. They're acting. They come with their own solution. We're going to see him do that a lot as he goes into this. But we see increased blink rate going into this whole thing. And then the minute the question comes out, he does an eye lock, immediate eye lock. And we say that eye lock is about seeing threat and recognizing threat. What's fun to watch for me is this lady interviewer is down to the right and shows slight disgust when that hatchet job question is asked. The male interviewer is doing something I, I beautifully love to see, I call brow beating, and that's looking under your brow as he looks at him and he's batoning with his head. This is brow beating on a global scale. I mean, one of the best I've seen. Then you see Scobie tilt his head in data intake, and that's just organism doing what the organism's done. He's waiting, and he can barely wait until the question's asked, boom, right out of the gate, no. And then you pay attention, though, as he starts to condition what he's saying, he backs away in the chair, and he has a slight smile as he does that not their friend. And you guys know how much I love an elongated vowel. An elongated vowel says, hold on, why, why'd you say that? Then he goes on to qualify, never met. We never sat down for interviews. The next question should be, what does that mean? But the guy does a similar question, the interviewer, and he, he should have just hammered him a little bit harder because then Scobie goes into this chaff and redirect. And, you know, I, I, my notes say, I'm a Scorpio and I like woodworking. That's about as pertinent as what he's saying here. It doesn't really matter. Then when he... When he starts to say Harry and Meghan, the, the one thing that happens wrong in this is the interviewer interrupts that and should have let him talk. His feet draw back under when he says it's tabloidy. Look, I, I'm just going to say this is going to be one of the best examples of this thing Mark and I have been talking about for weeks right here in front of you. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so this is interesting because there's a, there's some interesting relationships going on here. We've got the the female uh, interviewer, I think it's Alison Hammond, who kind of looks she's a, looks like she's lost a relative. <laughs> so it seems like she's at some kind of funeral. I mean, so it's interesting. No, like what's going on there? Why is she so down about this whole thing? Why is she so upset? We're not mind readers. We don't know. But I'm very interested in what's going on here. Uh, the male interviewer here, I think it's Craig Doyle. This is going to be quite an aggressive interview and quite aggressive for this particular show. This is, uh, as I understand it, this is this morning. Um, 
in 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 my experience, it's a it's a lighter show. So they're coming in, or certainly he's coming in quite hard. I think he actually took a little bit of criticism from the public in general after this that maybe he was too hard in this. I, I'm not I'm not quite sure about about that. But what do we actually get here? Uh, what is your relationship? Is is the question asked? Well, he answers with everything that it's not not what it is. He says, I'm not their friend. I've never sat down, never exchanged information, not in their private world. But the question wasn't, what's it not? The question is, what is it? So he's answering in the negative. That's already steering past, you know, the hot, the hot topic of this. And his head goes back at the same time. Something's going on here. He kind of suggests he's not restricted by the limitations he sees. He sees himself outside the press royal relationship. That kind of suggests he's a little bit anti-establishment. Um, and the interviewer uncovers, I would suggest, that he that this might be just a one-way channel from Markle to him. If he's not a friend, if he's never sat down, if he's then really it's just information coming from Markle through the press office direct to him and no chance for him to talk back and go, well, what do you mean by that? Who what, you know, are you sure about those names? So it's a one-way channel. And the interviewer, Craig Doyle, narrows his eyes and says it's quite tabloidy. And so clearly aggressive at that point. Interesting start, but I think Scobie looks quite well prepared on this. Lots of gestures there in the truth plane, lots of symmetry going on here. That will change as as we move along. Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, I agree. And to your point, Greg, when it, there's the phrase, I'm not their friend, there's a definite postural retreat. And this is when we lean back away from something. And this is kind of a way of distancing ourselves from a topic and also setting a little boundary or that space becomes a boundary. And I think he means this. And I think he's being honest here about this statement, which is, you know, this can maybe why you clicked on this video to see, is he full of crap or is he telling the truth? We're going to dig into that too, uh, which is one of the most important things to know that uh, probably people are looking for when it comes to this guy's i understand it there's a lot of internal dialogue eye movement which is when we're kind of talking to ourselves rehearsing something our eyes move down and left and this is just the home base for some people so this is where the eyes normally go so it's important to casually pay attention to this while you're speaking to people so getting good at eye movement isn't about the crap you hear on TV when somebody's looking one way, they're accessing the creative part of their brain, which means they're lying. That is horribly unreliable. So get some good training and you'll start seeing how powerful some of this stuff really is. But as a behavior profiler, when I see somebody who is head to toe covered in fads and the latest styles, there's something I've never seen an exception to to this day. When somebody lives like this, they are highly suggestible. They tend to lack stability in their life, and they tend to feel a deep lack of identity, actual identity. So these people are typically on a quest for some kind of self-discovery, but they kind of remain strangers to themselves. And I think this is amplified by the fact that he's muting all of his emotions. There's nothing whatsoever genuine in this video clip that's different than dishonesty, though. So him being not genuine does not mean he's dishonest. So I think he's telling the truth from behind the costume that he's wearing here. Scott? All right. First, I want to talk about the interviewers. The, the, like Mark was saying earlier, the the man, I can't, what's his, anybody know his name? Uh, yeah, it was, um, it's Craig Doyle. Craig. Okay. Well, yeah. when Craig comes right. in, he's, he's loaded for bear. He comes in hot and he's, he's doing what the a normal guy would do. And you come in and you, and you've decided this person is being deceptive. That's what he's, uh, I'll be under the impression he's already decided this guy's full of it and he's going in for him. So, and that's the typical protocol you see when a guy goes in, they, they're being all aggressive, aggressive. He's doing that. So, which is, which is fine. That's normal. But now let's talk about, and what's the woman's name? Does anybody know? Yeah, that's Alison Hammond. Alison. Now, I love her because 
She, I, when I when I first watched this this video, four seconds in, I I was under the impression this guy, no matter what he's doing or talking about, he's guilty of it or he's being deceptive or something because you can see it all over her. She's having none of it. She doesn't look at him for mo most of the interview, and when she does ask questions, or so watch when this comes up, as she speaks, as she talks to him, then she looks down and away from him. Doesn't even look at him when she's talking to him most of the time, so she, she she's had it. And we also see where she crosses her her uh, her torso and has her right hand gripping her left hand, and she's squeezing a little bit. I think she's uncomfortable because she's not saying what she wants to say in the fashion she wants to say it. She's not delivering her message the way she really wants to. So I so I think that's what she's she's sort of holding herself back a little bit from from an emotional standpoint because i think she sees it already so we know she's uncomfortable there and the reason she feels uncomfortable and i talk about it all the time on here but i want to go over it one more time because we get a lot of uh, uh people who haven't seen our show before they'll come in and go what are they talking about the male brain and the female brain are different now, i'm not just saying that because that's something i think it's a fact it's science you can look it up there's no question about it whatsoever they are different and their intake of information is a little bit different and the way that they decipher information is a little bit different from each other as well so the, a woman's brain a female brain takes in information uh, in in a fashion that lets it uh take in larger chunks and it gets a lot more information than the male brain gets and when she gets all this information, it starts. It goes back to the locus ceruleus, to make a long story short, and starts sifting through these things and say, where have I seen this before? Is this familiar to me? Is this good or is this bad compared to what I've seen before? Excuse me. And that's what's happened because men get what what's called the gut feeling. We had all those guys, we go, yeah, we got a gut feeling. I think this. Women don't do that. They have the most powerful uh, power of all, and that's women's um, intuition. So when they get that and they decide that something is a specific way or someone's not being honest or someone's being deceptive, you can almost count on it. 95% of the time, in my experience anyway, seeing that, they can call it quick. That's what's happening. He's going in, he's already decided he is, but he doesn't know for a fact from the, the things his brain's gathered that the guy is, is, is guilty or being deceptive. But I think... Looking at it from that perspective, she sees it that way. She sees that she doesn't believe him. She's not buying it. So the female brain and the male brain, this is a great example of seeing those two things side by side, treating the, I'm not going to call them a suspect, the, the person in questions answers and the way a male sees them and the way a female sees them when they're both their brains have engaged and gathered up this information. Now, let's talk about the body language, language of SCOBY. When he starts talking about not knowing Megan or Harry, he he straightens up and he smiles real big and he but but at the same time he backs up a little bit. He goes up, starts backing up a little bit. Now that can mean one of two things. It can mean one of a thousand things. But usually we see that and say, oh, that person may be being deceptive because they're 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 backing up. They're separating themselves from that situation going on because they feel uncomfortable. I think he feels uncomfortable saying he doesn't know her because I think he's under the impression that some people already assume that he's friends with him. That's how he got the information that he got. So when uh, when we see that, that, that right there made me say something's up here. And I can't tell if that smile is a full-blown, from his uh, standpoint, an emotional, real smile because he's Botox. He's just jacked with Botox. And I can't tell what's going on. Usually in a Duchenne smile, we or Duchenne, we see the, a little squinting here. It's different than normal squints. We've talked about that before. But that lets you know when a, a, a smile is real or not. We see virtually nothing from the, the mid part here on up. There's nothing moving around. Even the obicularis oculi, these little muscles down here, they don't move much at all either. When I first saw this guy, I called Greg and I said, hey, man, is this guy 23 or 58? I can't tell. He's, he's just an odd-looking guy with all the work he's had done. He's had mouth stuff done, I believe, from looking at him. I don't know what all he's had done, but he, he, he's, he's an odd-looking character with all the stuff he's had done. So I agree with you, Chase. I don't think he has settled on his identity of, of who he is yet. But I can't. I, I still. And what'd you tell me, Greg? He was forty-one or something. Forty-one or forty-two. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well. Okay. Yeah. So right there in the middle of what I thought, I just, I just couldn't tell. But. Uh, as he illustrates, 
let's pay attention to that because he's you can see his arms moving around stuff like this but then we see it very clearly that he starts illustrating this little fish thing he's doing with his hand into his hand like this with his fingers closed we're seeing no space between those fingers which lets us know we usually um put that in the in in the little box of there's no not much confidence there the more space between your fingers the more confidence you have or the person has they could be on the table they could be talking to you like this whatever it is, or they're, they're gesturing like this, the more space they have to, between their fingers, the more confidence they have as they're moving along. There is no space between his fingers. They're just sitting here like this, and he's pumping into his hand like that. It's just really weird looking. So he's he's trying to, to come on like he's confident, and I believe that's the reason for those elongated words at the end of the sentences like Greg was talking about. That that is, irks me to, to the end because he just keeps talking and everything he's saying at the end. So I believe sometimes when he is confident, he does that. But when he's not confident, but he's trying to act like he's confident about it or give you an answer that he's sure of or feels like he's sure of, he wants you to believe, that's when we hear those things get really long at the end. Those words being long, elongated m much uh, I was going to try to time it, but the times are are, are various. Are, they vary on there compared to what his usual uh, speed is for words at the end of the senses. But still, then we see those those uh, tongue juts. They're not really tongue juts. I think it's just a little tick he's got from from the lip work. You know, we've seen it several times on here when someone has had their mouth done. They'll do that little thing like that where they look like a cross between a bird, a turtle. And a you know um, a fish or something you know this, this weird tongue thing they're doing, and then when the interviewer says we know Megan was in touch for the first book, then watch his left foot, Ahmed's left foot. The thing raises up and it stays there for a second. And it's almost like it's akin to or similar to when 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 you ask someone something, or you're saying something, the person's wanting to say, hang on a second, I know I, I've got an answer for that. I think that's what's happening there because that foot goes up. It's almost like saying, hang on a second while that person is talking, which gives puts me uh, in the mindset that he's got an answer loaded and ready for that. He was already ready for that question. So he's got one that he's rehearsed. And it's, he may not have rehearsed it out loud. It sounds like he did, but he's a writer. So his vernacular is really good. It's 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 really clean. Everything that he talks about makes a little picture for you. It's great when he's when he's explaining things. But I believe this one has a little bit uh, extra pop to it because he's thought about that for a while, how he's, he's going to reply to that. But when we see that foot goes up, that means we're seeing something that's psychologically um, uncomfortable for him. And that little cue right there, that, that, that really got my attention. Uh, and I think it's, it's, it's important. And his voice speeds up a little bit. He starts talking about that as well, especially when he's talking about not knowing uh, Megan and not being friends with her. Listen to how his, his throat sort of tightens up a little bit, which makes his vo voice tones, vocal tone go up some, and it gets louder as he's talking. Then when he's explaining why he did this, or why he wrote this book, he starts, he places himself in this ethical spot of, of what a great guy he is, like he's a hero for talking about this stuff that that nobody's talking about. Well, nobody's talking about it because nobody really cares because nobody really believes it. That's my impression. They could, there could be a lot of people that believe that, and it could be true. I don't know. But that's the feeling I get. And we talk, I talk about it sometimes uh, where Kafka says uh, everyone is necessarily the hero of their own story. I say it's it's a that Kafka says that he only he doesn't say that he didn't say that sentence himself. But in his writings, you look at things like the Metamorphosis, the Trial, and the Castle. That's what his books are based on. There's a guy named John Barth that actually said that he was a another he was an American writer, more of a modernistic uh, literature uh, guy, and he's the one that actually said that. But when you look at Kafka's writings and his work, he does that most every time in his books. He, he makes whoever is in the spot the hero of the story, which is common. That's a, a common theme throughout literature and psychology. But so I'm going to call that the Kafka maxim every time I bring that up. So I'm going to sort of coin that now. So when somebody starts talking about whatever the, the problem is and they put themselves, I did it because I'm the hero and it was best for everyone if I did this, I'm going to call that the Kafka maxim. So, all right, I'll, I'm going on too long. Hey, one, one so, quick, one quick question, guys. Anybody else think that statement about not being bound by the same rules as the UK was out of place for what he was talking about? It felt awfully awkward to me. 
Uh, yeah, There's well, a lot of that in there. He what he what he's saying by that is that he was a um, he was uh, a reporter in the U.S. Right. And yeah, so, yeah, I get it. So but it just not, fell out of the way. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think he's trying to maneuver his way out of even if he did put these names forward. Yeah, which yeah, would yeah. not be in the I do rules too. Of, of the I UK. Do too. I do um, too. Yeah, yeah. So there's a. Re I think there's a reason for it. It's probably oddly placed in in this because that wasn't asked yeah. at this point. That's right. That's what I was saying. Is it's out, of, out, out, of, out of the way. Yeah. 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 Cool. Dang, Greg, get up in there, man. Get you some of that. Wow. My, my camera's too. My camera's closed. One of those tape replays. Well, Harry and Meghan, they kind of are largely untouched from negativity from your pen in this. So, you know, a lot of the speculation is that you are a mouthpiece for Harry and yeah. Meghan. So what is your relationship with Harry and Meghan at the moment? I'm not their friend. I've never sat down with Meghan privately for interviews. I've never uh, exchanged information with Meghan. I'm not in their private world in any way whatsoever. Are you fighting their corner? No. It feels I like I have been, are. during Meghan's time as a working member of the royal family, I was extremely sympathetic for the mm. position she was in. I was one of a number of journalists that are part of that small pack that covered the story for, as a full-time job. For me, there were things that I saw being written about in the press, that comments that were being made about her, unfair treatment when it came to how she was being written about compared to say how we've written about others in the past. And so I called it out. You know, I work in the American press. I'm not restricted by some of the limitations of being a member of the British press and that relationship with the royal family. So I did go on television and talk about the racism that she faced. And rather than anyone wanting to talk about it or listen about it, I was called her fan, mouthpiece, cheerleader, etc. So I can't run away from that narrative. It's stuck. You know as well as I do that tabloid nicknames stick forever. But Harry well, and Meghan... See, this is where I have a bit of a... And I don't mean to cut across Yeah, here. go for it. I find a lot of this content quite tabloidy too. Yeah. So, you know, you, you, you got to bear it, the brunt it, of that as it well. It delves as into... As part of the American press crew, you don't have a, a role within the, the reporting pack over here with the royal family. We know Meghan was in touch with the first book and, and, and sent some advice your well, way. Well, she wasn't in touch with the first book. Via an aide. She spoke to her communications officer yeah. and I discovered that okay. at the same time as the rest of the world so it happened. But it's, um, so it happened. It's so, the job of a communications officer at the palace to deal with the press. If you like this video, get the full body language breakdown and analysis on our main channel by clicking this video right here.